Well, good morning. I, I'm Dr. George Trawick from the National Defense University. Thank you for uh, coming to my quick uh, quick pitch. I'm going to talk about this morning. We're going to get around to cryptocurrencies and blockchain, some of the newest technologies out there. Make sure I don't have that feedback going on. Uh, so most of you probably have heard uh, about this thing out there called the deep web. Uh, have you heard of it? Deep web? What about the dark web? Are they the same thing? Because you know, a lot of times what we're seeing now is the media is taking those two terms and they're using them synonymously. And they're taking those terms and confusing us. So let's talk about what is the deep web and why, why it makes it different than the surface web. The deep web is this part of the internet that's not indexed. So you're not going to find it in a Google search or a Bing search. Like that? Okay. Um, a Google search or a Bing search. These are the type of sites that are, have the databases, the backside of, uh, for example, um, hotels.com or uh, the hotel sites. When you go to those sites and you put in your search for a room, you, know, you put in the day and the time and how many people you want. And when you hit submit, that's when the website goes into the deep web and it searches all the databases that the hotels have come and then it brings that stuff back to you on the surface web. So the deep web are those things that you don't want to have direct access to. You know, bank transfers and, and those databases. So that's the deep web. The dark web's a little bit different than that. Now we hear about the dark web, we always hear about it in this you know, super negative tone because we got this idea it's dark. Now when we hear dark, what do you think of? What does that bring to mind? Matt? What does that bring to mind? What does dark bring to mind? Anyone? Scary? Bad? Well, in, in this age, when we hear the, the leadership talk about our enemies going dark and sites going dark, what they're really alluding to is encryption. So these sites use an encrypted type networks, encrypted sites you have to have special access to get to. The analogy that I, I love this picture, I found it right off Google, but it's a great uh, analogy of the internet overall. You think of the internet as the oceans of the earth. What Google and Bing and what we're really used to is only getting the top couple of feet of the internet. So as you see here, that's Twitter, all these little fish, that's Twitter and LinkedIn. But down below that is the deep web. And those are the big databases, the academic databases, that's the backside of uh, the hotel searches and such. Then way down at the bottom is the dark web. And the analogy is really good here because you got a monster and the dark web does have bad things in it. You see over to the left, the little submarine. That's very analogous as well, because you can't get into the dark web unless you have a certain tool. You gotta have specialized equipment to get into this area. And that's called the Tor network, the Tor browser, the onion router. But you also see the tentacles are not all bad. What else can the Tor be used for is free speech, political dissidents, abilities to overcome oppressive regimes. And finally, over here in the far right, you see the little sunken ship? That's what happens when you get down in this area and you don't know what you're doing. Because there are bad people waiting to take advantage of you here. So we got the, the surface web and the deep web and the dark web. Well, let's go into the dark web and talk about what are the type of things, why do we have it? What makes it work? Where did it ever come from? So there's two things in man's lifespan that makes the world go round, right? What is it? Money and love, right? Could use a nice term. Money and love, right? Two things. You can pull everything down that we do to those two things. So on the internet and in the dark web, there's a special type of currency. It's called cryptocurrency. This is where we're going to go. We're going to talk about cryptocurrencies and how they work and the new technologies that are helping um, support cryptocurrencies and where we're going with it. So you probably heard of Bitcoin, and that's kind of getting the moniker of all cryptocurrencies now, so, you know, kind of like the, the Coke and the Pepsi, but there's plenty of different types of cryptocurrencies out there. Bitcoin just has the top of the bill right now. So as I, as I go through this next piece, if I refer to Bitcoin, I'm really referring to 
all different all the different cryptocurrencies and how they're implemented. So the, the bit the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies are based off of a relatively new use of technologies called the blockchain. And when I say the relatively new use, the components of the blockchain are not new. It's based on encryption and cryptography um, components. So let's look at that for just a second. What makes the cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin, so attractive that people are willing to, to invest large amounts of money in order to earn money? One of the areas that Bitcoin has and the other cryptocurrencies have that normal currencies do not is that there's no third party. This is a complete peer-to-peer -peer operation. If, you're, if you've ever been familiar with um, Napster and some of the other peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent type networks, the cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin, uses that type of distributed network in order to uh, change transactions. It's a digital currency that is completely digital. There's no physical analog for it. It's made digitally, it's transferred dig digitally, and then when it disappears for the digital map, it doesn't come back. There's no, no reinventing it. But the main thing is nobody controls it. The network controls itself through a peer-to-peer -peer trust or uh, relationship. And what makes it special, especially for we call unbanked people, people that don't have access to the other financial systems, this is a technology that folks can use simply on their smartphone. They can use have money, they can do transactions, they can stand up an entire business without ever having a real bank in the old sense of having a bank. The peer-to-peer -peer network means there's no middleman. So here in America, if we make a transaction that's $10,000 or more, has to be reported to the IRS. In the Bitcoin network, there's no such middleman. There's nobody in there making those judgments. There's nobody asking you, what are you spending it on? Who are you giving it to and who is it coming from? And that has both negative and positive connotations because it does enable some bad people to do their bad things without being known because of the anonymous nature of Bitcoin or the crypto systems overall. But the system doesn't care. All this system cares about is balancing the books. So in the physical world, we have a bank and the bank controls the central ledger, that third party. In the Bitcoin world, the distributed network does what computers do really well, which is make perfect digital copies. So instead of there being one central ledger, every user on the network gets a copy of the ledger. And every time there's a transaction, all the ledgers are updated at the same time, all the users get to validate the transactions, and if somebody's trying to cheat the system, that transaction will get tossed back out and then the system will balance itself out again. That peer-to-peer -peer trust and some other technologies I'll talk about is what makes the whole network work. So we talk about the distributed nature means that there being no central point of control and any one of these nodes in the distributed network can go down or be taken down and it doesn't affect the overall operations of the, the Bitcoin network or the cryptocurrency network. So how does this work? If you're familiar with, we're going to talk about um, some public key encryption and hashing next. So this, the whole thing works off of the public and private key for encryption. If you're familiar with how this works, every user that comes onto the network, and you can do this now, you can go download the Bitcoin software, and when you do, you'll be issued a public and a private encryption key that allows you to do transactions on the Bitcoin network. And this is how it stays anonymous, because I don't send Bitcoins to anyone by name, I send it to your public key. And when you send money to me, you'd send it to my public key. And we validate those transactions 
using your private key, that's like your digital signature on the web, this is how it balances out. You've probably heard about Bitcoin miners. I'm, a, I'm mining Bitcoin. It's just an analogy. I like the analogy of a bank teller better or a bookkeeper because that's really what you're doing. When you're mining for the coins, what you're really doing is going through the calculations necessary to balance the books back out. And whoever balances the books and creates the next set of blocks will get rewarded with new Bitcoin. So it's, it's called mining because you can get a reward, but like a lot of mining for diamonds and gold, a lot of times you just come up and just have to keep digging. So this is an example of what your private key would look like and what your public key would look like if you haven't seen those. Now the, the important part here, if you may have heard of people having their Bitcoins taken or stolen, that can only happen if you lose control of your private key. So if you, as an individual, like I was talking about with the dark web, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not managing yourself properly, somebody can get into your system, extract your private key, and then take ownership of your bitcoins and then disappear back into the ether. And this happens occasionally. So it's not the Bitcoin network that's getting hacked and pulled down. It's individuals that's getting their money taken. All right, so we have to talk about for a second, though, what brings all this together? How, how does this work? So the Bitcoin network and the mining piece of it relies on what's referred to as a digital hash. It's a one-way function. So if you see here, it's a one-way function that always has a fixed output. I like to refer to it as a digital fingerprint. You know, you've got a full-size person, but we could represent you and your identity with just this little fingerprint. In the example here, you see how Fox comes out. It's an eight-digit eight hash. We call this the digital hash here. And even if the size of the input triples, doubles, the size of the output does not. But more importantly is that for every unique input, I get a unique repeatable output. So if even one little bit changes, here I change the word from run to walks, and you'll see that the, the hash itself changes all the way across. We call this diffusion, all the way across the hash. This is where we get the integrity of our transactions. So this is how we assure that the, the transaction that you put in place is the transaction that actually gets recorded through the hash routine. For Bitcoin, we use the blockchain. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how a blockchain comes together to assure these transactions. Think for yourself just a number of transactions that's going on right now in Bitcoin. Say every 10 minutes, there's about 7,200 to 8,000 transactions that happen. Every miner on the network, and there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of them on the network, will reach out, grab a block of those transactions, about 7,000 of them, and pull them in and try to create a unique hash for that set of transactions. We take all those transactions, plus some special numbers, and try to come up with a special output. Now, what has to happen with, with Bitcoin, what, we, what they do, they set this, see here at the, at the front end, this set of zeros. So Bitcoin will tell you, you've got to keep hashing this routine until you get a front line of zeros. And I'm going to demonstrate that in just a second. The first miner that can come up with the transactions plus a random number that they put in and meet the requirements of the hash gets the Bitcoin. Everybody else simply gets the block and adds it to their blockchain. So the blockchain here, and it's demonstrated here, goes all the way back to the very first transaction. It's an immutable record. And the blockchain technologies, although it, it may have started out with Bitcoin, has now branched out and can be used for almost any type of transactional um, operations that we have, whether it's finance or um, housing, anything that you want, an immutable record that you can go back and check and know that the integrity of the, trans the information has not changed. 
the way it's chained together is by using that hash function. So I'm going to show you now um, how this comes together as a block I'm, so I can give you a better understanding of how a hash works. So if you go ahead and pull that up. First, I'm going to demonstrate a hash. You know, instead of the fox and the fox runs, this is the, the SHA-256 hash, which is the standard for us in DOD. What I want to demonstrate to you is no matter what data If I type in my name or any other keys, I want you to keep your eye on the bottom of the hash, okay? Every time I type in my name, I will get this hash. If anything changes, the hash changes completely. The, the real thing that, that's neat that, about the hash, though, is it doesn't matter how much information you put in, whether it's one word, one sentence, a book, a whole movie, that output is always going to be that known link. See, the link doesn't change, but the hash does. And that's really the power for the hash. It's unique every time. When we build this into a block, a blockchain, we add in a couple of new numbers. So we have here the first block. First block plus another number. This is the random number that we have that each miner will add to the mix. So you see here we've got three zeros. I'm sorry, four zeros starting off. If I add in those ledgers, and let's just say that this is just the, uh, the transfer to a key. So that's, that's the two transfers. The miner has to now hash this routine using different numbers until they reach the required number of zeros at the front. So that took 711 tries. If one thing changes in here, say I wanted somebody wants to go back and say it wasn't $43 I got, but it was 431. You see how the hash changes? And that takes the transaction and makes it irrelevant, throws it out, because the, those leading zeros are now gone. And the only way to get them back is to start mining again. This time it took 7,000 tries before it got. Now in the real Bitcoin network, it's hundreds of millions of tries. Hundreds of billions of tries before they will come up with this set of numbers. As I add an additional zeros to the front, the work, the level of work goes up. Now how did the blocks come together? There we go. All right, so for this, this would be the blockchain. And what I want you to pay attention to is see, we have the leading zeros. This is the first one. So we arbitrarily have all zeros. You make it out of thin air, somebody's got to start it. So the first block, and we get the hash so that we had four leading zeros. This is how we chain them together. This output is mixed into the next set of hashes. And remember, if any one, one bit changes, the hash changes completely. So if I go back and change something here, okay, how's that? Is that better? No? Turn it off? Okay, good. Now let me show you what happens. If I try to go back to the beginning of the hash and change one of the transactions, you see how they all turned red? That's what happens in a Bitcoin network. Something changed, some, the integrity of the network is out of whack. And what they'll have to do is rehash everything to get it back in and check. But what really happens for this, if this happens in one node, this transaction will just get thrown out. And the network will rebalance itself. 
Okay, so that just a demonstration of how the blocks are chained together and how the integrity of the hash function keeps the integrity of the network in check. So every node on the Bitcoin network is doing this work. And if it turns red, everybody will see that on the network and say, hey, look, something's wrong. Take that transaction, toss it out, get the network back in balance. This is what the, the actual ledger sheet would look like. If you downloaded the Bitcoin wallet and did Bitcoin software, what you will receive is a ledger that has every transaction that Bitcoin has ever made, all the way back to 2008, where the very first Bitcoin was spent, up to today. It's about six gigabytes of just text data that looks like this. But what you have the ability to do now is your computer will go through and validate every one of those blocks. Take about 24 hours for you to go for your computer to go through and rehash and validate that none of those blocks have changed. And then once you're caught up, your computer and your wallet will make sure that the network stays in, in balance. The key thing here is look at the two line. It's just a public key. So we can see the money moving, we can see the transactions, and we know who has move money only by their public key. So if you are careful and you never tie that public key, you can stay anonymous with this. However, it's very easy to mess up and tie an identity to a key. For example, if I go to buy some Bitcoin, I want to put some Bitcoin in my wallet and I use it, I put my, my Visa card. Well, now I I pulled back my anonymity because I've tied it to a card. But if I went to Walmart and just got a gift card, right, and got $100 on it, now there's no name tied to it. So I can stay anonymous and put money and buy Bitcoin anonymously. You don't want to end up like the little ship at the bottom of the ocean because that's what happens. And you get out there for the first time and the bad guys are asking for your private key and you mess up and send them your private key, you've given up all your Bitcoin. So it's, it's that idea that you've got to know what you're doing before you get out and start doing these type of transactions. All right, so that is a real fast overview of how blockchain and the dark web come together to use Bitcoin to make it a viable network that's still uh, thriving out there. Well, thank you. I appreciate you showing up and, uh, for my uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you.